on chapter 3. Several years ago, I read some of the books of Fyodor Dostoevsky. That's a hard Russian name to pronounce, Dostoevsky. Uh, he was a, a Russian novelist, and, and most of Dostoevsky's works are, are great by almost any standard. But the one that remains uppermost in my mind is Crime and Punishment. Anybody ever heard of Crime and Punishment? Uh, it's the story of a young student in Russia who commits a serious crime, and his name is Raskolnikov. Raskolnikov, well, Raskol, Ra, Raskolnikov, it's hard to say, isn't it? He was poor, and he needs money, therefore he murders an elderly pawnbroker who, he argues to himself, is of use to no one and whose life doesn't really matter. And as a result of his crime, Raskolnikov is launched upon what he thinks is just going to be this great, prosperous life, all this money. And, and yet in the novel, there is this relentless outworking of judgment for Raskolnikov's act, punishment follows crime. And the novel's point is that the young man stood condemned from the moment he performed the act. And really, this is how Scripture describes us, mankind, spiritually. We don't stand on neutral ground because we have already made our choice. We have already chosen our own way. We have already committed the crime of rebellion against our maker. As, as Isaiah writes, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us to our own way. Paul declares in Romans, there is no one righteous, righteous not even one. There's no one who understands. No one who seeks God. Now, we might not like that. We, we might not agree with that, but it doesn't really matter because these things are true because they're true from God's perspective. We have gone our own way. We have already committed the crime just like Raskolnikov. And therefore, every one of us, naturally, we are already under God's curse, His judgment. And this is the necessary addition to the great and wonderful truths that we've learned recently in John 3, 16 and 17. Let me remind you, these verses tell us, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. But when we say that, really there's a question that immediately arises. All right, but what of those people who do not believe? How about them? How about those who do not believe? And so the verses before us this morning deal with that question. And they tell us that those who have not believed are already under God's condemnation. Let's begin reading in verse 18 where Jesus says, Whoever believes in Christ is not condemned, but... Whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And so these are Jesus' concluding comments to his conversation with Nicodemus that we've looked at a lot here in John 3. They are incredibly eye-opening for us today. I think they provide the backdrop for what we see happening in American society just right now before our very eyes. I think they help us see why the cultural elites in our country and now just normal people are racing as fast as possible to turn America upside down. Why there is such a rush to overthrow the values and the traditions that have held our society together for generations. And so I think Jesus' comments reveal four truths about light and darkness that all people, saved or not, need to hear. And the first truth is that in our essential moral lives prior to the gospel, we all live in darkness. 
We all live in darkness. Referring to himself, Jesus said, the light has come into the world. And that harkens back to the prologue of this very gospel where John said of Jesus Christ, the light shines in the darkness. Darkness already reigned. The world, spiritually speaking, lives in darkness. The world functions in darkness. That just means people grope and people stumble over stuff in life. People are living their lives just by feel. I remember showing up for class one day when I was in school and my teacher looked like he had run into a brick wall. In fact, he had run into a brick wall. See, he had arrived early for school before the janitors had turned on the hallway lights. There's no windows in the school. It's kind of weird. And so just walking confidently down the dark hallway, he thought he knew the way through the open door. Well, he did not know the way. And I mean, he slammed right into the brick wall. His face was so bashed up, you can't believe. And really, that's a picture of all of us prior to hearing the gospel. Because in our essential, moral, spiritual lives, we live in the dark. We navigate life in the dark. We make crucial decisions about our lives. I mean, who to marry, what risks to take, who to trust, what to do or not to do with our bodies, all in the dark. And then we make eternal decisions in the dark. And so it's not surprising what we see here that, that people get bashed up terribly by navigating their lives in the dark. Well, that brings us quickly to the second truth about light and darkness. The appearance of light forces a crisis of choice on every person. A crisis of choice. Do you believe or do you not believe in Jesus Christ? And that ultimate question forces a crisis of choice on you, on everybody. Verse 18, Christ says, Whoever believes in Christ is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Condemned already. There's that first truth again. Apart from Christ, we all live in darkness. But once the light entered the darkness, every single human being is presented with a crisis of choice. Because light forces a choice, belief or unbelief. No one's in a position of neutrality. Apart from Christ, everyone already lives in darkness. Everyone's already making their own decision about their life. You know, agnostics. Agnostics famously say, look, I can't know whether God exists. You can't know. How can any of us know which religion is right or, or if any of them are right? And that sounds so tolerant to our modern ears. That is just dark unbelief because everyone apart from Christ has already made their choice. No one can plead ignorance. No one can say on judgment day, wait a minute, hold everything, God. I didn't know. I didn't know about the possibility of salvation. I, I never even heard really of Jesus Christ. I never got to make the choice. No. No one misses the light. No one in the dark misses the light. The light has come into the world, John says in verse 18. The light, he wrote in chapter 1, shines in the darkness. No one in the darkness misses a light when it appears suddenly. I remember sitting on a lake shore in the Canadian wilderness on a very, very dark night. It was overcast, so the stars weren't even shining. Just pitch black. And my friends and I assumed that we were the only ones, that we were totally alone on this lake that was a million miles from anywhere. But suddenly, just like, a light appeared just way off across that lake. It's a campfire. Impossible to miss, right? Pitch dark, and then there's that light. Impossible. And the light from that, that fire just stood out vividly against that vast darkness. No one in darkness misses a light when it appears suddenly. And no one will be able to offer up an excuse to their maker on judgment day for their unbelief in Jesus Christ. The Bible makes this so clear, especially in a place such as Romans 1, where we read, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness, do you get this, suppress the truth. They know. We know the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, be, plain to them because God has shown it to them with that light in the midst of the darkness. For God's invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they, all of us, naturally are what? Without excuse. Without excuse. It's another way of saying condemned already. As we read in verse 18, condemned already. 
And this brings us to the third truth about darkness and light. So we've seen, first of all, that, that all people live in darkness apart from the gospel. And then secondly, the coming of the light forces a crisis of choice upon every person. Well, the third truth that arises from Jesus' comments is, is this. Tragically, in an astonishing act of self-destruction, multitudes refuse the light and embrace the darkness. Jesus said people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. And I really don't need to work very hard as a preacher to explain and illustrate this point given the times of unprecedented change in which we live right now. I think Jesus provides here the explanation for what in the world is going on in America? How is it that we are putting to death time-honored virtues and traditions and, and embracing rapidly things that were unthinkable, it just seems, yesterday? By way of illustration, how and why has, has this particular statement come to be regarded as coherent and meaningful? This one, I am a woman trapped in a man's body. Not me, you know. But, but, <laughs> It's funny, sometimes I'll say things like that, and, and a parent of a small child will come to me later and say, my child thought you, you know, so not me. But how and why has that become, you know, coherent and meaningful? My grandfather died in 1996. That's less than 30 years ago. And yet, I think if Grandpa had he, I don't know if he ever heard that or not, you know, in, by 1996, but if, if he ever heard that uttered in his presence, I have no doubt that he would have burst out laughing. He, he would have just thought that was a joke, just, or, or at least incoherent gibberish. And yet today, today, that's a sentence that many people in our society regard not only as meaningful, but so significant that to deny it or question it in some way is to reveal yourself as stupid, immoral, or subject to just irrational phobia. And those people who think that it's, that it's meaningful, listen, that they're, not, they're no longer just relegated to these and restricted to these elite college campuses. We're just talking about ordinary people who have little or no direct knowledge of queer theory, critical postmodern philosophies that are being taught in these places of higher learning. This is normal people. You know, that statement, I am a woman trapped in a man's body, I think that perfectly captures Christ's third truth, that multitudes refuse the light and continue to embrace the darkness. And the refusal and the embracing, I mean, they are traveling at warp speed now. America of the past had deep roots in religion. Religion, Christianity in particular, gave us our culture really our shared embracing of virtues and traditions and values and adults well adults in the past they worked hard to pass these things along to each new generation of children you think about our, our heroes of the past were those people who exhibited these morals and these virtues that that culture at large embraced and that, that explains why we always have celebrated our founding fathers War heroes, adventurers, inventors. We did that in the past. You know, fitting into American society in the past meant adjusting yourself to the norms and expectations that America at large embraced. Ah, but new thinkers came on the scene, didn't they? What if, these new thinkers said, what if we put to death these traditions and values of the past. What, what will happen if we throw off these shackles and these fetters to which religion and American tradition has kept us shackled? What if we create a new psychological man and woman and they're free to, to express their inner individuality? Oh, but they say, but he can't just be tolerated. This new psychological man and woman, they can't just be tolerated by society. Oh, no, no, they... They must be celebrated by all of society, celebrated by everyone. Oh, but that's going to require a total, total culture makeover, right? This is going to require the death of, of really everything that past generations clung to. And so now here we are, years into this social death works. Death works. I'm using a term from Philip Reif. Uh, just did groundbreaking research into human society's death works. And we're now years into that. And so the new water that we're swimming in now, well, it's no longer new water in American society. This new society we live in, this is just the water we, slip, we swim in for everybody. It's normal and natural. So my grandfather 
He might not have gotten the comment, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. But listen, today, many, many Americans get that. And they don't just tolerate it. They celebrate it. And, and they look with suspicion at anyone who is stupid enough to have a phobia against it. Let me give three examples of these death works, just to kind of flesh out. And these perfectly illustrate Jesus' third point, that multitudes refuse the light and embrace the darkness. And the first, as you can see, it, this is a quintessential death work of our day, pornography. And you might wonder, well, how is pornography a death work? Well, think about it. Pornography re removes the real intimacy of married partners and displaces those acts to third parties. It perverts the intimate giving of spouses to each other. It becomes an object of base pleasure and illicit profit for others. It immerses everyone involved, the actors, the vendors of the pornography, the viewers of it, in, in an illusion of a fantasy world. And really, it wrestles away from God. It wrestles away what God gave as a gift to spouses to foster closeness, companionship, while at the same time being the avenue through which families are made and ultimately societies are established. So do you see it? Do you see it? Pornography is definitely a death work because it attacks something sacred which has its origin in God as the giver of life and the giver of marriage and family and societies. And so our new society, well, it can't have these things, which explains the rapid rise of pornography. A second example of a death work that reveals that multitudes are rejecting the light and continuing to embrace the darkness is just a basic repudiation of history. History. This is an absolutely necessary component to death works. Cultural progressives who want to radically change a society's values and traditions, they always attack society's history. Specifically, to deny history as the source of authority and wisdom. So traditional societies always value their history because history provides the framework for teaching each new generation how to fit into society. History helps the younger generations learn that life is not all about them, but they must fit themselves into the whole for the betterment of the group. You know, this happened around campfires, for instance, among Native American peoples. If you're from a Native American background, this is what your ancestors would have been done. The elders would gather around at night. They'd gather the youngsters around. And they would just tell these oral stories and these oral traditions and the beliefs, passing on their culture, helping the little ones understand, here's who I need to be to fit into the group for the betterment of the whole. This happened more formally, happened, you know, traditionally here in Western civilization, kind of in the classroom, history classes. But today's new psychologized society, well, it wants life to be well, all about me, right? All about the individual and his or her right to express themselves publicly. And more than that, to know not just the right to express myself as an individual, but I have the right also to know that I'm being affirmed by everybody else out there, right? That, it's not enough, you see. For gay couples, for instance, to be legally married, it's not enough. That's just toleration. That's not enough. In the new society, people must express their inner person outwardly and openly and critically. They've got to be celebrated and affirmed by society. It's not enough that, that a lesbian couple, for example, could find any number of cake shops in town to make a wedding cake for their wedding. You see, that's not enough. The one cake maker who refuses to do it on religious grounds, he has to be legally coerced into making it. And if he doesn't make their cake, well, that tremendously hurts their feelings because it cuts right to the sense of their identity, their feelings and sense of really who they are. It removes their right to express themselves for who they are, and it robs them of their need to be heard and to be affirmed by society at large. And so really these are just examples that show that forgetfulness, the re repudiation of history, that is a hallmark of societies who are trying everything they can to reject the established values and traditions of their past. It has become a very dominant trait, trait by the way, in modern education in America. Let me quote Carl Trueblood, a very good historian. He says, it's not simply that society just happens to be anti-historical in the way it approaches history. 
it has a vested interest in the actual erasure of history. Erasure. That is precisely why, by the way, we are seeing history being ignored and rewritten in our society. It's why, have you noticed this on the news? It's why schools are being renamed all over the country. It's why statues of past heroes are being torn down. Because those people that were pictured in the statues, they did not in their lifetime live by the, the ethics, the new ethics of the modern 21st century. It's why reading, writing, and arithmetic are being shoved aside in favor of critical race theory and gender-sensitive training and other woke theories. Because here's the thing. If a new generation of children is not taught one thing of value, well, guess what's going to happen? They're going to embrace something else. And that's what's going on. A third and final example of a death work that reveals that multitudes reject the light and continue to embrace the darkness is abortion. Experts who study human societies have long noticed that abortion must be accepted and even promoted by societies that are working, working very, very hard to forget their past and to embrace a new ethic. In fact, abortion functions really as, as an emblem of societies that are anti-historical and therefore anti-religious. They have got to flush away their past. And nothing represents that more than flushing away an aborted human fetus. So here's what Carl Trueblood says on the matter, and he borrows this term death works from Philip Reif, who I mentioned earlier. Let me just quote, abortion is a death work. Not simply because it works the death of the unborn child, but because it profanes that which the world once regarded as sacred, human life made in the image of God from the moment of conception. It revises the definition of what it means to be a person and also makes that which was once thought to be a person into something akin to a piece of garbage or excrement. It is therefore anti-religious because it takes that which is most sacred in the social order, life itself, and flushes it down the toilet without a second thought. And it is anti-historical because it erases the physical consequences of the sexual act be between a man and a woman. In short, it is an act that can be deemed routinely acceptable only in a world that has repudiated any transcendent framework in favor of the individual preferences of the immediate present. And so these three examples of death works perfectly illustrate the truth of what Jesus said. Verse 19, people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Remember, people are condemned already. Remember, prior to the gospel, we all live in darkness. That's the first truth. And yet, God sent his son God so loved this dark world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. And yet, faced with that crisis of choice, are you going to believe in that one and only son? Faced with that choice, it's weird, in an, in an astonishing act of self-destruction, multitudes of people reject the light and re refuse it and choose to continue living in darkness. Condemned already! Their condemnation will therefore grow deeper and deeper and deeper. And this is happening person by person. And it will go on until judgment day. Their judgment day for them. It will be individual on judgment day and their eternal hell, their eternal punishment. It is growing worse and worse and worse as they continue to embrace the darkness. Well, let's close by looking quickly at Jesus' fourth and final truth. So in a total contrast to everything that I have just said, what horrible dark news that all is, some come to the light. Some come to the light. Verse 21, but whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And really this is just a beautiful, poignant description of, of the gospel, of salvation, of being born again. Whoever does what is true, Jesus says. Well, what does he mean by do what is true. He means stop believing the lies that you're believing. I don't care what religion it is, what philosophy it is, what lifestyle it is. What, stop! Because there's only the truth revealed by the light and everything else by definition is a lie and it's falsehood. And Jesus is saying stop believing the, the lie 
He means come out of the darkness into the light. Admit that you are a Raskolnikov by nature. Confess that you are already condemned by your maker because you already committed the crime. You and I are sinners in the hands of an angry God because he's holy and just and righteous. And we have to admit that. And then Jesus says, so that it may be clearly seen that your works have been carried out in God. And this is interesting. It's a very brief reference to how these big Bible concepts, justification and sanctification, work together in the life of a believer. So sinners are justified by faith alone. But I want to tell you, it is not by a faith that is alone. James writes, faith without works is what? It's dead. So Christian living, what the Bible calls sanctification, it necessarily follows justification. Here's kind of the order. Guilt, guilt over your sin. Guilt that you realize you're condemned. You realize you are a Raskolnikov. You know that you. Guilt drives you to grace. And then grace floods your heart with gratitude. You cannot even believe that God would save a wretch like you. And so guilt drives you to grace. Grace floods your heart with gratitude. And that leads then to just living your life in the light. Guilt, grace, gratitude. And so we live our Christian lives striving for good works that glorify God because we are so grateful that Christ our Savior did it all to make us right with God and to keep us right with God. You know, so I baptized young Canton Green last Sunday. Remember, wasn't that beautiful? I love it. Every time we get, hello, Canton. He looked at me. There you go, buddy. It was last Sunday. We were up here. His little sister was asking me about baptism this morning, and she asked me, Canton, if you were scared. And I said, well, did you ask him? She said, no. And uh, she asked me if I was scared up there a little bit. <laughs> I said, are, are you going to be scared when you get saved and baptized? She goes, oh, yeah, I'm scared of it. <laughs> <Isn't that> <laughs> it's kind of scary. But I baptized Canton. So, Canton, nine, you're nine, right? Canton, nine years old. I mean, nine. Can anybody remember being nine? Canton's probably going to live another 70 or 80 years on this earth, isn't he? Long time. What is he going to do with all of those years? How is he a born-again Christian? How's he going to live? Well, he's going to do exactly what Jesus said. To quote, he's going to live his life so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Here's what that means. Canton is going to try his best to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves Jesus. And yet, come on, fellow sinners, what's going to happen to Canton over and over, over those 70 or 80 years? He's going to fall down. He's going to fail the Lord. He's going to sin, right? Each failure is going to remind Canton of why he needed the Savior to begin with. His need for the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior never goes away, does it? In fact, I think the older I get, the more I understand about myself and sin and God, the more I realize how sweet and lovely our Savior is. And Canton's going to get that. And each time he remembers that great salvation, gratitude, it's going to refill his heart, and he is going to get right back up, forgiven, and just keep on following the Lord. That's what he's going to do. And he's going to begin to work works that show that they have been carried out in God, as Jesus said it, carried out in God. So his works don't justify him. His works don't make him right with God. We can't earn our salvation. We can't boast in it. It's all a gift. But they sure give evidence that we have received freely the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I close just simply and directly. Are you still condemned? Are you still condemned? Are you being swept along in our new society that celebrates man and puts to death God? Having seen the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, are you going to continue to reject him and continue to embrace the darkness? Or will you come to the light so that you will not perish but have everlasting life. Would you please stand to your feet and bow your heads. God, we come to the end of this passage, really the end of this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. Nicodemus, who represents us all, mankind's best representative, coming with man's best religion, with man's best wisdom, wealthy, talented, well-placed, a mover and shaker in society, and yet totally lost. And there is nothing in Scripture that indicates that he ever came out of the darkness and embrace the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we pray, God, that, that no one in this sanctuary would make that mistake this morning. And I pray that any, uh, any and all of us who have been saved out of that and have been brought into the light, Lord, if we have turned our backs on you, 
and we've run and followed our own way, God, I pray that today would be the day that you bring us back. We rededicate ourselves to you. Come back and embrace the light of the gospel. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.